Welcome to the AlphaList podcast. I am your host, Toby. AlphaList is a closed community with over 400 CTOs who share their knowledge and experience in a Slack space and at events. With this podcast, we want to give our members and interested parties insights into the thoughts and ideas of top CTOs. If you're interested in becoming a member of the community, please visit alphalist.com to find out more on how to apply. This episode is kindly supported by Fastly, the biggest challenger in the CDN market. Fastly is pushing ahead the technical boundaries and is, from my perspective, the best solution on the market. Fastly is known as one of the key drivers of the Edge Cloud movement. Well-known customers of Fastly are Shopify, the New York Times, Reddit, GitHub, and many, many more. If you want to try it all with first-class support, just go to fastly.com slash alphalist. Welcome to the Alphalist podcast. I am your host, Toby. And today with me, I have Charity Majors. And uh, she is actually one of the coolest, if not the coolest, and most passionate women I've seen in tech, potentially ever. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> besides that, she's CTO of Honeycomb.io, an observability platform with, I think, 50 million in funding. She has the funny nickname Mipsy Tipsy and 60K followers on Twitter. She's blogging on charity.wtf. Uh, and I think that that all tells a lot about her. And uh, yeah, I also want to make a compliment. She has very nice hair. Um, oh, thank you. With a, with a, with a very nice <laughs> Just <color>. got it dyed. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, Charity, do you want to add anything there? I think you summed it up. <laughs> Okay, great. Um, I, I want to start with my like favorite introduction question. Charity, what is what is your nerd path? How did you get into 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 IT? Oh, yes. Very, very weird road. Um, well, I was homeschooled in the mountains of Idaho. Um, we had no computers growing up. I went to college on a performance piano scholarship when I was 15. And um but I pretty quickly realized that all the music majors were still poor <laughs> when they were in their thirties and I, and I wanted to make money. Um, I also like, I, I walked by the computer labs and there were no women in them. And I'm like, well, obviously that's where I belong. Um, so I started hanging out in the computer labs and, um, started working as a sysadmin. Um, uh, I think when I was in my junior year, I got offered a job in Silicon Valley for $75,000. And I'd never even known anybody who made that much money. Uh, so I came to San Francisco and um, I've been here ever since. Okay. Uh, and and uh, why did you think that's your thing when you saw that there are no women in there? I have a deep contrary streak. It's it's not particularly healthy, but it's. I feel like most of the things I've accomplished in my life have been in some way fuck you. And, and I get a lot of energy from just like um, doing things when I'm told that I can't or shouldn't or don't belong there. Okay. And uh, what was then uh, when you when you uh, jumped to Silicon Valley, what was your first job? I was a sysadmin for a company called Critical Path. Uh, we handle the world's email. <laughs> ah, yeah, I remember that one. I wrote the first ever spam filters for Qmail um, as part of that job. Ah, crazy. Yeah. Crazy. And, and, and then you somewhat stumbled into databases, right? Um, and yeah. I think you were working for Linden Labs, right? Yeah, I, I started Linden Lab. I was there for five years. It was my longest job before, honey, before Honeycomb. And um, we had this massively fa massive failure when we tried to upgrade our MySQL database. Like it, <laughs> all of the load tests that we ran said that, you know, that 5.0 was going to be faster. Um, so we upgraded the master and it wasn't, <laughs> it wasn't faster. And we ended up having to roll back an entire day's worth of transactions. And it was, it was a nightmare. Um, and nobody wanted to jump on this grenade. So, so I did. Uh, and I spent a year basically developing a load testing framework where we could capture 24 hours worth of traffic and replay it against the primary and like switch out various, you know, things in the config and the, and like the the disks and and stuff and and I and I finally got it 
Um, and, and and just like looking at the, the output diffs, you know, like what what did what do different versions return, and how are the indexing plans? You know, so I learned a lot about databases internally. Um, so we finally upgraded. Um, it went beautifully. I was so proud. And then six months later, we got SSDs, and it meant that all of my work was absolutely useless. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely pointless. <laughs> so I guess you know quite a lot about high availability and databases as well, or yeah. have like maybe a strong opinion. Yeah. <laughs> After that, I you know my I I also worked at Parse, the mobile backend as a service. I was their first infrastructure hire, and um, we ran MongoDB basically from its inf infancy. And you know I was using MongoDB back when it had a single lock per replica set. And so like learning how to tune that and how to run that. And like, I feel like I was MongoDB's um, biggest and most cynical developer evangelist for a couple of years there. Uh, so, so yeah, I, I was, before I did observability, I'll, I was mostly known for databases. Okay. Um, so you were one of the early naive adopters uh, yeah. who then realized, oh, this thing has a global write lock. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It was super fun. But you know, that's how databases grow up. And, and I feel like I learned a lot too from that, from watching how, you know, Megan Gill and the folks who ran the marketing side and the community side, what they did was they bought they bought the database enough time to grow, for the tech to grow up to, to fulfill its promise, right? Um, it started out <laughs> pretty jank, uh, but, you know, they IPO'd and, and it's a real live database now that does, you know, can be handled with financial transactions. And, and I, I think that, you know, without that really strong community support, they, they would have been, they were already kind of a laughing stock. They never would have gotten the traction that they needed to, to stay around long enough to grow up. I mean, it's just engineering problems, right? It's just engineering. Every, every product goes through this. It's just that, The closer you get to writing bits out on disk, like the more challenging it is, the more careful you have to be, et cetera. Um, and you know, most and most databases don't get that time, don't get that wide adoption to actually mature. Yeah, um, I think they did that quite well, like through somehow incubating through the community, right? Um, and also incubating through or influencing through, meet through, little through meet meetups, and, through events. Yeah, yeah there, really there was one, one, one great article around it uh, where they where, where that strategy was really described. And they were, yeah, it's, it's crazy how they how, how much they grew and how well, um, and they, did they a couple were leading things. the NoSQL. No no they sequel did a couple of one, things, right? very smart things, right? Um, for one thing, I think that the, the merging of like the SQL grammar and, you know, libraries and ORMs is still just, oh my God, if it's easy enough for developers to use, you better believe that it's abstracting away way too much for you to, to ever be confident that you're not, you know, picking the right index or something, right? It's just, it's a kludge. Um, the, the, the JSON, you know, query language that MongoDB has is much more developer friendly. It's much more, you know, it's, it, it's the same thing. It's JSON, right? Um, also, you know, that, uh, Postgres, MySQL still don't have a great replication failover story. It's still like elaborate. <laughs> it takes like a full time person, you know, just just to set it up and configure it and understand it and run it. And that that you know that alone, being able to just like automatically fail over, you know, just having the votes and the and the arbiters and being able to you know switch the 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 primary around from node to node without it being a big deal huge that's huge that was like revolutionary from an operational perspective yeah but, i mean like from from my uh, memories um it, it got a bit harder whenever you wanted to wanted to scale it to more than one computer and then you had all the, those different ideas and 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 functions involved right i mean yeah, it there's a bit of a learning curve but it's yeah. it was worlds better than anything else out there in the sql world also, yeah. like something like Parse would never have been possible without something like MongoDB, because we were we were letting developers build their mobile apps on top of our backend, which meant that like we had we were we had to be very naive about what the workloads would be. Maybe it'd be a write heavy like gaming app. Maybe it would be like you know a read heavy app. Maybe it would have a lot of strings. Maybe you know we didn't know, um, and you can't just 
you can't just do that with a, <laughs> with a database that, that forces you to have schemas and migrations and, and all that stuff, you know. So while MongoDB in many ways like gave you a lot of rope to hang yourself and a lot of ammunition to shoot yourself in the foot, um, you know, if corralled correctly, it also gave you a lot of flexibility and freedom. Obviously, obviously. And they were really like leading and spearheading that NoSQL movement, right? I mean, that is they they essentially discovered it, I would say, um, and 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 made it really easy to 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 use and to to to, to grasp. Uh, that is like obviously a nice thing. But we're not here to talk about databases. So when, then you jumped on over to Facebook with Parse, I guess, right? Yeah, you, you've been acquired. Facebook acquired Parse, and then you started Honeycomb, or. Uh, yeah, after I left, after I left Facebook, I started Honeycomb. Um, it, uh, it, you know, running all those workloads, you know, because we had over a million mobile apps running on Parse by the time I left. Um, and, you know, trying to figure out, you know, because when, when something gets slow in a distributed system, everything gets slow. And trying to figure out what got slow first is really, really hard. And, uh, you know, I tried every monitoring tool out there, every logging tool, every, you know, and they all, they all basically, if you knew what was the problem in advance, then you could find it again. But if you didn't know what it was, finding it that first time was just prohibitively difficult. Um, you know, like New Relic would have like a top 10 list. Well, what if the problem was an app that was like number 172? You know, it's just completely invisible to you. Um, and, you know, the, the process of, figuring all this stuff out and, and like just working through that. <sighs> Finally, we started using this one tool at Facebook called Scuba, which was butt ugly, like aggressively hostile to users. But it let you do one thing really well, which was slice and dice in real time on high cardinality dimensions. So suddenly we could break down by the app ID and then break down by the endpoint and then break down by, you know, the the build ID or, you know, just all these things that were actually impossible in the last generation of, of tools. And um, the amount of time it took for us to figure out what the problem was dropped like a rock, like from open-ended days maybe to like seconds. Like it wasn't even an engineering problem anymore. It was, it was like a support problem. And so that made a huge impression on me. You know, when I left Facebook, I, I had this, this sort of sense of, oh shit, like, I don't want to go back to engineering without these tools because I, I'm so much weaker as an engineer. Like all this time, I, I, I now remember all this time I would spend like crafting dashboards, like stumbling around in the dark and that wasn't fun. I didn't want to do that. Um, so, you know, for the first time in my life too, I had a pedigree like coming out of Facebook. Like I've never had a pedigree before. I'm a fucking dropout, you know, I'm a dropout who's worked at startups, none of them terribly notable, you know, um, and Facebook didn't make me a better engineer, but coming out of it, people were like, ooh, maybe you would like some investment money. So whatever. I felt like an obligation to take the money and run. <laughs> uh, I never figured that, I didn't didn't really think that we would succeed though. I just figured, you know, we'll take the money, we'll build the tool, we'll fail, then I can open source it and then I'll have the tool. <laughs> <laughs> That's a very good idea. Mission accomplished. <laughs> So you didn't fail yet. Didn't fail yet. <laughs> Keep not failing. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Great. So I I imagine like uh, I mean every element in an app is somehow generating time series data, right? Um, every single component in a microservice mesh generates time series data, and I think your tool is analyzing it, right? Basically, yeah, like whenever a request enters a service, we initialize an empty, empty honeycomb event, pre-populate it with a lot of stuff, parameters, you know, stuff about the environment. And then you can also like insert stuff like, ooh, shopping cart ID, I should stuff that in, whatever. And then when the request is ready to exit or error, we ship that off to honeycomb as one arbitrarily wide structured data blob. And in a maturely instrumented system, that might have 300 dimensions, 500 dimensions, whatever. But the cool thing is they're all collected by the request ID. And, and and the span ID, right? So with with these with these requests, what you can do is you can correlate and go, oh, there's a spike in this and there's a spike in errors or something. What 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 do all of those error um, events have in common? Or you know, all of the all of the if you see a spike and you might go, what is it? Oh, oh, it's all of the events that are this build ID for this language pack for this. Uh, device ID for this, you know, and, and this was just actually impossible before this. Um, in Beforehand, you had to like predict, 
oh, there might come a day when I need to know about the errors for this build ID, for this, you know, blah, 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 for this blah, blah, blah. And that's just, that's just impossible. You can't predict all the ways that the system is going to fail. Okay. So it sounds like a, like a neat debugging tool everyone wants, right? <laughs> yes. Every, everyone, and it's, it's, it's better, you know, deep, I, I talk a lot about observability driven development, you know, where you should have, you know, your window open with your ID and a window open with your, your lens on production. And you should be writing code. You should be instrumenting it as you go. Just, you know, in, in the same way as you're commenting your code, you have a little, a little thread in the back of your head going, ah, future me is going to want to know this, right? So like future, future you is going to want to know these things. Comments are just like, a description of your system without reality. It's just like, mm. I, you know, it could be completely out of date. Instrumentation is real commenting for your code, right? It's like deep commenting for your code. It's, it's comments plus reality, right? It's not going to lie to you in the same way. So if you're instrumenting as you go, and then you have a CI CD system that gets it out automatically within minutes, um, then you can literally have it be muscle memory. You write code, it's live, and you look at it. And you look at it through the lens of the instrumentation you just wrote and you ask, is it doing what I wanted it to do? And does anything else look weird? You know, and, and you can find like 80% of all bugs right in that, in that tight little feedback loop before customers ever experience them. You know, feedback, f Facebook did this great piece of research just, just a few months ago where they, they showed that from the moment you write a bug until it's discovered, the cost of finding and fixing it goes up exponentially. So like you're writing a function, you typo, you you backspace. Cool. <laughs> That's really fast, right? As soon as it gets out there, right, um, the, the quicker you can find it, the better. Because, you know, if, if you find it in a week, if you find it six months from now, it just gets harder and harder and more and more expensive to locate it and find it and fix it. Because it's obviously like out of your short term short term yeah. memory and it's it takes all about time that short term memory. Test it again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, obviously, context switching is is hard for 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 humans. For computers, it's hard. For for humans, it's, it's also hard. And uh, that is something I can clearly follow. So, but would you would you then advise to test in production? <laughs> production. It's just a question of whether or not they admit it or not. <laughs> you know, you can either be like, no, I never do that and, and just like ignore it. Or you can acknowledge that you do it and invest in doing it well. Right. I feel like just in the past five years, we've gotten so many great tools that, that help you do it safely, that help you do it in a low impact way, that help you, you know, whether it's feature flags or, you know, some of the router mesh, you know, routing stuff or, or, um, you know, observability. They're just, you know, there are so many ways to, to do it safely. I feel like the bulk of your energy now should be going to hardening production, you know, looking at stuff in production, not pre, not pre-production stuff, right? There, there are some basic, basic bars that you should cross, right? You should write tests, you should make them pass the tests, right? But like, There is a point of diminishing returns, and there is a large category of things that you will just never, ever find in a non-production environment, especially as your team gets more and more skilled. So, yeah, I, I, have, I had a t-shirt on earlier. I'm sad that I changed it now because it said, I test in prod. <laughs> <laughs> Very nice. Yeah, I, I have to admit I did that too every once in a while. And um, I still remember like the very early days I, I somehow started with, uh, I think, Perl and then stumbled into PHP stuff when you were actually uploading your stuff to the live system via yeah. FTP. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. It was also like a very direct feedback loop. <laughs> you know, um, and it's so true. Like that was the original way that we wrote and debugged code. And it's it's like, then there was divergence, right, into dev and ops. And, and, and a lot of the stuff that we did was really healthy and really good, right? Like adding, adding tests, adding like, you know, adding like a CI CD pipeline, you know, all this stuff, but it also kind of severed that, that virtuous tight cycle, that, that tight feedback loop where you could find it and you could fix it and fixing it was cheap and easy. Mm -hmm. Yet yeah, all, it all simply returns to that thought, right? And you, you suddenly have systems like telepresence, for example, in, in the Kubernetes world where you can 
I don't know, re replace a, a production container somewhere with yeah. your local system and <laughs> then just give it a try and understand it nice. in a very, very direct way. <laughs> so, and, and you, you, you help with your, your service to, 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 to test in production essentially, right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you shouldn't just go test in production if you don't have the tooling to make it worthwhile, right? Like if you're just like, and this is where, you know, the, the technique of, Adding log lines everywhere has, I think, given testing and produ production a bad name because it's so easy to just like, oops, if you get that lo log line inside the loop instead of outside, suddenly you've taken the logging cluster down or you've, you know, ex exhausted the local memory in your disk. Um, you know, it's there. there is definitely a right way to do things and a, and a, and a wrong way to do things. Um, but I do feel like as an industry, you know, more and more of these good tools are are available to us you know we don't have to like write them ourselves we don't have to re re resort to the clumsy old ways that gave it such a bad name and now you actually have a dashboard uh, where you can log in and um like see yeah the results of your yeah, tests um, absolutely even just like progressive deployment was which is one of the things that i i love um which is a term for you know um not shipping everything to prod at once, but like, you know, shipping it to one node. And, you know, then if you have something like Honeycomb where you can break down by build ID and, and instance or container, you can just like let it run for a while and compare like side by side. What do they look like? Right. And and then slowly raise the gate, you know, 10 percent, 25 percent, 50 percent, 75 percent. And, and then 100 percent. And it also gives you the ability to have multiple versions running in production, which um which is an anti-pattern of the past, and I think a, a strong pattern of the future uh, if you have the tools to manage them because it allows you to learn so much in a short amount of time. So now you mean the canary builds uh, that yeah. you slowly fade in? Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, it's a, it's, a, it's an interesting way of seeing it, um, uh, but but as, as soon as you think more about it, it, it absolutely makes sense. But but isn't it also about then, or isn't like one necess necessary ingredient also shortening the path to production in terms of build time and so yes, on? Uh, absolutely. So, so decreasing velocity essentially or? Absolutely. This is, you know, I've spent a lot of time thinking about, because there's so many ways that systems and teams can, can, you know, mess up and get, can get inefficient. Um, and I've spent a lot of time thinking about like, what is, what is the key, right? What is the, what is the lever, you know, by which you can move the world? Um, and, and I really think it is that interval between when the code is written and when it's in production, making that as short as possible and almost as important, making it automatic, not having any human gates, right? So that once you merge your code domain, all the stuff happens and it goes live to production without anyone doing anything so that you can predict so that you can so that you know right so that you can feel it in your gut um that that you know once you've merged it you know you you have this like sensation that it's not done yet and um in, until you go look at it right and if, if that if that interval is like an hour that doesn't work that doesn't work with your gut right it, then you have to like look at the clock and stuff but if it's within a few minutes you can literally like get that feeling in your gut that it's not done And, and that's just, that's so powerful. Like, you know, it, we've all read Accelerate by now, you know, we've, the four Dora metrics, you know, how often do you deploy? How long does it take to deploy? How often do they fail? How long to recover, right? Those are the four, you know, real indications of, of how high performing a team is. And the single best way to make progress on, on those is to, is to shorten that, that interval between, between when you write it and when you, when you've deployed it. So shorten deploy time. What what is your from 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 your perspective like a, a maximum deploy time that uh, you you should have in your in your day to day? Fifteen work? minutes. Fifteen minutes. And uh, how how long does it take to to build your dashboard, for example, in Honeycomb? Um, it's it varies, but you know it's it's been around three minutes for a while, and then it was around fourteen minutes. I think it's back down to nine or ten minutes right now. So whenever that happens, then you. Uh, like and, and this optimize is, the Docker containers again, or what is? This is the thing where, like, if you if you have a CI/CD pipeline that takes hours or days, um, whew, days, God, it's terrifying. 
um, then it's it, it can be really daunting and difficult to get it down to 15 minutes. But if you just start out that way, right, if you just start out with code that automatically deploys to production as soon as you've merged it, and you grow up that way, and the team just expects it and internalizes it, it's actually very easy. Okay. Um, yeah, I think so too. Um, yeah. And, uh, and, and once you have developers that have experienced working that way, they never want to go back. Obviously, I mean that that awkward moment, and you have time when you have time to, to pick up a coffee, uh, call a friend, um, uh, read the news, or something like that, and then just go back to your CI/CD yeah. pipeline and see that the build failed um, is yeah. is, is uh, terrifying, right? Yeah, it should be as quick as quickly as possible. Absolutely. Okay. You know, we we waste so much time, you know, as as engineers, like. On, on waiting on other people, on waiting on tools to finish, et cetera. And, you know, the CICD pipeline is 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 such a great place to start just because it's, it's at the core of what we do. You know, if you're, and it also forces people to do a lot of other good best practices, like keeping your diffs small, um, keeping, you know, code, you know, when, when, when it takes a long time for CI/CD to run, you get into like, like like this death spiral where, because it takes so long, your disks get really big, which means it takes a long time to review them, which means you t spend a lot of time waiting on each other, which means you know, and it's just like everything takes longer and longer, and pretty soon you need a team twice the size. You know, if if it takes like X number of engineers to write and ship and maintain a, a you know a system that uh, with a 15 minute deploy time, it takes at least twice as many engineers if it takes hours, and twice as many again if it takes days. Like that's a lot of waste, you know, and that's not fun waste. That's that's drudgery waste. This episode is kindly sponsored by Okta Customer Identity Management. If you're transforming into a digital platform and are facing identity management challenges, listen closely now, because Okta offers the market-leading solution to help you make identity and access management work as a service. A platform that offers endless ways to connect with your employees and customers. Get support for your most important customer-facing initiatives. Integrate identity and access into every app and create secure and engaging experiences in no time by outsourcing workforce or customer identity management to Okta. Get started in 15 minutes and test IAM or CM as a service. Create frictionless registrations and login experiences for your applications and make identity the foundation for your zero trust strategy and enable access for all users regardless of their location, device or network. Visit alphalist.com slash Okta to try it out. In an upcoming episode, I talk to Zagnik Nandy, Okta CTO about everything identity management. I have another question towards that direction, not, but not, not, not uh, like exactly. What, what do you think about the complexity of modern systems? So I, I think I read a blog post of yours that um, every developer should also be a DevOps person or consider himself a DevOps person, person in terms of you build it, you run it, um, or you build it, you ship it, you run it. What do you think about that? Um, is that true? And is that something you can I expect that, in the next... I, I don't... I'm not really asking everyone to do both jobs. I, I, I'm I not. I, what I do think, though, is that systems have gotten so complex that you really can't expect a different team to run them. You know, you have to have the team that is writing them and building them. You have to be on call for your own work. Um, and I also think that, you know, this this is, has to be part of a grand bargain between engineers and managers, where engineers agree to be on call for the for, for their highly available you know, 24 seven services and management, it's their job to make sure it doesn't suck. Like, I, I think that it's reasonable to ask anyone to be woken up two or three times a year for their system, right? That's reasonable. If you don't have a small child, I mean, anyone with an infant is exempt obviously, but like, you know, the rest of us, we can wake up two or three times a year, um, which means that we need to be given the time to to fix things, the time to, you know, to, to fix technical debt, the time to like, you know, really fix these, these problems that not just slap a bandaid on them, right? And this is where 
ops people can be your, your, your greatest ally because ops people know how to run systems and can help advise you in ways to like take the toil out of running them. But yeah, I just think it's, it's actually impossible. And honestly, it's microservices that made this impossible. Microservices thrust so much of the system into, you know, the network layer and the, the systems layer that you, you have to become part systems person in order to develop for them. So what do you think about microservices then? I think that you shouldn't do them until you have to. I, I think that you should never embrace any complexity that is not thrust upon you. If a LAMP stack will work for you, use it. <laughs> if you can get away with vanilla MySQL, God bless, right? Like the problem is that for more and more of us, we can't, our, our problems can't be solved with just a LAMP stack or just a vanilla MySQL. So, you know, you should mindfully adopt it, but not just like, don't just read Sam Newman's book and go, well, he's smarter than me. I guess this is the way, right? Like be, be, be mindful about what you're adopting and, and only, only take what you need. But as, as soon as you have a single page web app, you often enter the world of microservices already, right? Um, like necessarily in a way. Probably. I mean, you, yeah. you put a wall where no wall has been before. Right. Um, you think that this is a valuable direction or? I, I mean, I am not a front end person. If they tell me that single page web apps are the way to go, I'm like, okay. You know, I. <laughs> I'm not an authority on that. Um, I, I think that oh, microservices, is that a, is it the right way to go? I think it's inevitable. You know, I think it's inevitable for social reasons as much as it is for um, technical reasons. Um, I think that, I think that, you know, systems like the big monoliths that we have have just gotten so large that you're just, there's too many people trying to do stuff on too small of a, a patch of ground right and it's just it leads to lots of locking problems and and uh, so I think it's inevitable and I also think that you know there are there are some good things that come with it you know the the ability to degrade gracefully is not something you can really do with monoliths in the same way and and the more we can decouple you know each other's responsibilities from you know adjacent teams and uh, then hopefully the more, like the goal is to only get paged about and get woken up for problems that are yours and that you can fix, not ones that are someone else's that you can't fix. And monoliths just make that really difficult. Mm -hmm. I, I like the term that I think a friend of mine once used, uh, the CTO of Picnic, Daniel Gebler. Uh, he said he, he, he was inventing the phrase meso services, I think, meso services, like medium-sized services. Yeah. <laughs> I think that's... Uh, sure. That's a, a good way to go, right? Um, uh, instead of uh, tearing everything into very, very, very small bits and yeah. pieces, um, which makes it very complicated. Yeah, yeah. You don't want to do like the thing where, I mean, I've seen teams where they've got like, you know, six or seven services per, per person. And I'm just like, what are you doing here? <laughs> you know, so yeah, there's a, there's a Kool-Aid and let's not drink it. <laughs> Okay, um, let's not do that. Okay. So, um, what do you think is is needed to to achieve production excellence um, in general? Um, I mean, we we briefly touched it with deployment time and so on. Uh, what 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 else do I do? I need to take an account. Well, I you know I think that there's a lot of technical things we could talk about. You know, observability and and um, you know CI/CD and blah blah blah. Um, but honestly, I think that for for technical leaders, there are two real things to focus on, you know, which is one of them is the fact that every system has, um, it has two, oh, not consumers, but like two, I'm blanking on the word, has, you're, you're responsible for, for two things, right? There's the happiness of your users and the happiness of your engineering team. And these two, they will go up and down in tandem. There's no such thing as a set of customers who are happy long-term with an engineering team that is suffering, right? There's no such thing as an engineering team who's like living the high life where customers are suffering, right? And so I feel like too often, you know, 
leaders feel like they can ride their teams hard or something or or some and, and that's just bullshit like you in fact you know the happiness of your team can really be a really important canary in the coal mine when it comes to how your customers are doing and, and vice versa you really have to care for the mental health the emotional health the the um you know the in, the interactions between your team you know uh it, it matters just as much as your customer's happiness and uh, constituents. Every that's what I'm looking for. The word every every system has two constituents: um, engineering teams and and their users. Uh, and the second thing is that this is all about feedback loops and systems, right? Like it's 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 not about individual points. It's about because the systems feed back into each other, which is why you know that that unit of time between when you write it and when it's live is so important. Um, so, you know, if you think about the system as a socio-technical system, um, and like your entire job as a technical leader is to, is to pinpoint inefficiencies in that system and work to resolve them. There, there's, there are very few problems that you can solve just with the technology or just with people. And that's why, that's why you get paid lots of money because <laughs> you supposedly know enough that you can blend the two disciplines and um, that's where all the interesting problems are, I think. Um, funny enough, but you just almost answered my next question, which, which would be, uh, so you had like a, a popular blog, blog post of yours. Um, it is. It has the title, You Had One Job. Um, yeah. And it, it, is around, it is around focus. And I just wanted to ask you, um, could you define in one sentence the one job of a CTO? Um, and God yeah, damn it. I think you, <laughs> you almost pinpointed it already, right? <laughs> yeah, I think so, that, <clears throat> you know, what's funny about the job of CTO is that every single CTO no, oh, I know is different, like in a radical way. There is not, not a template for CTO-ness. I've been asked by junior folks, like, what does it take to become a CTO? And I'm just like, I don't know. I genuinely don't know. They're all different. Um, but if I had to generalize, I'd just say that whatever your company needs most from you, from a technical perspective, it's your job to provide that. Sometimes that's, you know, evangelism. Sometimes that's, you know, deep, you know, architecture. Sometimes that is, you know, it could be anything, but your job is to provide what is most needed by that particular company. Obviously, um, still, like it often comes with a lot of defocus and a lot of different things um, you do at once. Yeah. Um, besides, besides the leadership bits, like I mean, just looking at you, I mean, you have a lot of followers on Twitter. You are a successful blogger. You're a CTO. You're a very technical person. Um, so. What 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 would you say is the the thing you focus on most, um, and is that the right thing for for the past few years? It's been evangelism. It's been like trying to explain observability to the world, trying to explain. Also, I feel like Honeycomb is going to succeed or fail to some extent, to to the extent that the rest of the world gets better at writing and running software. So just like looking at what that's why I started ranting about CI/CD because I'm just like I think this is really holding people back. So. It's kind of a privileged position just to be able to sit back and, and think about, you know, what would help people and, and try to boil that down into something that's understandable. Okay, but you're not only evangelizing on, on, on tech things and, and observability, but <laughs> also like... a little like... bit of everything, you know? <laughs> a little bit of everything. I mean, your blog posts are kind of, I would say, polarizing sometimes. Yeah, and, um, it's true. I'm not always uh, making friends. It's... Fine. You're 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 tickling the nerves of the few people. <laughs> um, are you sometimes uh, like afraid that this can can fire back? You know, I didn't expect to be around this long, so I wasn't really thinking about it. Uh, you know, I I we try to be clear that there's a difference between Honeycomb the company and me the person, right? Like that it, it's not the same thing. I'm not always speaking for Honeycomb. I I don't know. Like I I've made mistakes. I try to own up up to them. Um, but like, I'm not sad about people who are bitching and whining about the fact that I say deploy eggs on Fridays or not. <laughs> you know, if you actually read what I've said, I don't think it's that inflammatory. It's just that it, that it gets picked up by other people and, and refracted back in a way that's like, well, obviously that's very inflammatory, but I didn't say that. <laughs> Does that actually, um, like if you look at the war of talent, um, is that like maybe a differentiator for your company as well? I mean, does that does that inf like somehow influence your culture? It's it's definitely 
one of our core values is that we are not we're not afraid to to be a little bit provocative, you know, to 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 go a little bit farther. You know, honeycomb itself is a very disruptive tool. It's not we're not building on the the gains of, you know, the 30 years of metrics tooling that's been built, you know. It's it comes kind of from out of nowhere when when you look at it, which is why you kind of have to unlearn some bad habits and relearn some some new habits when when you when you start to use it. Um, but so so yeah, I mean I think that some of the stuff that we were saying early on, especially was very, very provocative, but it's less provocative now because more people have come around. I just learned that uh, working at Honeycomb um, is uh, being part of a little tech and development revolution, right? Because you just do it differently. Um, what are your <laughs> maybe three lessons learned and, and, and takeaways from your time as a, as a CTO? Um, And maybe even beforehand, uh, I, I think like honesty is something you picked up very early. Uh, but but what what are our values and 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 uh, like potentially lessons which which you give to others? Yeah, I think that's something that we've done a little differently at Honeycomb. Very one of our company values is we hire adults. <laughs> we hire adults. That means that you know we don't spend our our you know our optional money on like kombucha fountains and stuff. We spend it on healthcare for families. Um, it means that we don't expect people to work crazy hours. We don't police how many hours anyone works or where they're working from, or, you know, we trust you and, um, we trust you to be an adult and to, and to be in control of your emotions and to be immature, you know, be good at communicating and, and all that stuff. Um, I, I feel like There's there's a lot that's infantilizing about modern <laughs> corporations and and companies and and I I just I I really reject that I think that people can handle the truth um, and I think that people want the truth um, when it, well, transparency is 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 you know something that I very that's very important to me and in fact I think that one of the lessons that I learned after a year or two was to back away from the transparency because it was it was um, cause it was distracting for people. Right. And to be a little bit more selective about it so that they know what's going on, but they aren't getting, you know, just like, it can be a bit of an up and down, sort of like a roller coaster ride sometimes, you know, ah, this is great. Oh no, this is terrible. And, and it's, you know, they, they don't need to know all of the, all of that. They just need to know how things are going in general. Um, so, you know, yeah, it's a journey. Um, let's see what else. <sighs> I, I I guess I guess I I really reject I really hate hierarchy I think it's this really distorting lens that um, makes people unhappy with what they what they have and and you know if if I had my way I think that I would I would pay everyone an almost equal salary <laughs> so that where you worked in the in the hierarchy was more reflective of what kind of work you like to do because I really think that the work that most people like to do is being an engineer is working with customers is doing something that's close to you know the means of production right that's that that's where you get that tight feedback loop of seeing the impact that your work has had on the world right and for most people we find that really validating and really inspiring really motivating and as you get quote unquote up the the food chain you you get less of that and and I feel like a lot of people are in those positions for the wrong reasons they're in their those positions for you know uh, well it can be a combination of good and bad reasons like I know the reason because that I became a manager was because I wanted access to the information because I was so annoyed at being shut out of you know The, the rooms where the decisions were, were being made, you know, and I wanted in those rooms. I, I wanted to know what was, be, what was being decided and I wanted to know that information. But, you know, if, if we remove that by, by just like letting engineers like know what's going on and, you know, letting them make decisions about the technical stuff, then most of them, I wouldn't have wanted to be a manager if I had actually had that autonomy and that, that decision-making power, right? And so I just feel like it's a very distorting lens. And, and it's one that I, I think that more engineers should, should understand the power that they have. Like in a tech company, 
Nothing happens unless we build it. Like that's, that is the ultimate supreme power, right? And, and yet so often we just kind of, we just kind of like accept that, oh, well, only managers get to do these things and stuff. And that's bullshit. Like, you know, I, I think that a lot of times it happens because a lot of times managers pick up the, the baton as, as a last resort because engineers aren't, you know, sort of muscularly like, performing their role, like insisting that, no, these are technical decisions, you know, technical people should make them. We we need access to this information so that we can make good decisions. You know, like, I, I think that really there should be a parallel track of ICs and managers that goes all the way up to VP. You should make the same comp, you should have the same, you know, ability to have impact, you should, you know, be as respected and whatnot. Um, I, I think that, yeah, so I don't know how to sum that up. But um, I believe that ever more, more than ever, now that I'm quote unquote on top of the, you know, now that I'm in, you know, this CTO seat, um, you know, <laughs> rising up the, the the ladder doesn't doesn't mean you're less constrained. It just means that you're constrained in different ways. Obviously, uh, that's correct, and I think it's also very important for a manager to not not lose, not lose track is the wrong word, but not lose connectivity uh to 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 what is happening in tech right and yeah like especially as an engineering manager Absolutely. still understand the game uh, and because you then also feel the pain you also feel the pain i think engineering managers should still be on call i, I, I think managers should be on call <laughs> so you are on call every yeah. once in a while or me it's been a while um but i would like to be again okay um so are you still coding every once in a while or once in a while <laughs> yeah, mostly for fun. Uh, though. Any 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 nerdy tools or um, uh, nerdy productivity hacks you recently discovered? Oh God, <laughs> I've been playing with different editors recently, which has been kind of fun because I've been just a Vim and Emacs person for life. I've typically used Vim when I'm working in systems and Emacs when I'm writing code. Um, but turns out. You these these IDEs have come a long way, and writing code is a whole lot easier when you use them. Huh. And now you use a true <laughs> IDE, or you just use VS Code or something? I. What do you use? I I use VS Code. I don't use VS Code. <laughs> no, um, no, I haven't. I haven't decided. Okay, yeah, I've, I've used TextMate for for quite a while because I'm a Ruby person, um, and, <laughs> and DHH kind of influenced us all. But um, then nice. kind of kind of sticked with with VS Code. I, I still have a little surprise for you. I um, just recently got a secret um, account from a colleague of yours. Um, mm -hmm. uh, the username is God Mode um, for for Honeycomb IO. It's yeah. a special account for your own platform, and it 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 has like a pre-released version with a little hidden, um, like gray on gray icon in the dashboard. It's um, labeled Time Machine if you just uh, zoom <laughs> on it. Um, and um, I just had the idea to to now hit this little button. I just logged into the system, and um, it actually that little beast allows us actually to travel back in time. And uh, I, I'm just hitting it, and uh, I enter the year 2004, and uh, that is just the time when you started working at Linton Labs, I think, and you were building or actively involved building Second Life. Yeah. And we now have the chance to observe you for a little while um, <laughs> and to hit pause. Um, oh, and dear. now you have the chance to actually whisper something into Young Charity's <laughs> ears. What, what would it be? Oh, it would be, um, don't stick it out. Like if, if you know it's right, you'll know whether you should leave in the first week and you will be right. <laughs> um, I, I, I had a couple of jobs after Lind Lab where I felt that I owed it to them to stay a year. I was just like, ah, I know that I hate it, but I, I owe it. I owe them a year. I didn't owe them shit. I should have just left. <laughs> so quit as soon as possible. <laughs> quit, quit. <laughs> If you know you don't like it, there are better jobs. There are more jobs. There are infinite jobs out there. Just like have some confidence. Quit. <laughs> okay. That's a good answer. So um, thanks a lot, Charity, for your time. Yeah. Um, thanks for was, having was, me. This was fun. was very entertaining and, um, and good. Uh, good, good. Good takeaways from my perspective. Um, enjoy your day and hope to talk to you soon. Sounds great. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.